Thanks. Welcome to this video audit. My name is David Andrew Singer. I'm an associate professor here in the political science department at MIT. Um, and we're very pleased uh, today to have with us Marco Mazzucchelli, uh, who is a visiting scholar here at MIT. He is one of Europe's best known bankers, um, having served in a number of senior positions in institutions such as Morgan Stanley, uh, Credit Suisse, and most recently as the chairman of the Global Advisory Council and head of global banking at Royal Bank of Scotland. Let's start with the short-term future of Europe, since this is an area in which I think you have unconventional views. Um, so observers seem to be reasonably confident that the countries of the Eurozone will be able to hang together and to make the necessary steps and create the necessary institutions to sustain the common currency. And just a few days ago, Spain seemed to have a reasonably good auction for its sovereign debt, which is generally seemed to be a fairly good sign about market confidence. But as to the future of the Eurozone and the common currency, you're less optimistic. Why? Thank you, David. Um, indeed, I think that the conventional wisdom in, in this respect is that the European leaders will find a way to keep the whole Eurozone together. And so there will be some muddling through over the next several months, but the outcome is going to be positive. I beg to defer because I think that some of the changes that has occur have occurred in, um, in recent months uh, throughout Europe and the Eurozone are extremely serious. Uh, we had, in all respect, uh, what uh, economists call a sudden stop. So we had a complete reversal of a private uh, circulation of capital um, among the Eurozone countries. And so the private claims uh, within Eurozone have been completely replaced uh, with official lending, official claims. That means that the, the, mar the market for credit, the market for savings in Europe have been completely balkanized. They're balkanized along uh, national boundaries. Uh, um, most of the circulation of credit and savings is within every single national um, um, countries. And that, mean, that means that at this time, a possible breakup of the euro is much less catastrophic in terms of consequences of what it would have been otherwise, because the consequences would be only for the official claims between central banks, so between the creditor central banks and the, the debtor country central bank. Also, my belief is that the, the other um, um, argument that is usually um, raised to um, uh, exclude the possibility of a breakup, that is that the conversion back into the individual currency is a mission impossible. I think it's, it's not entirely accurate because, first of all, we did it on the way in. So we replaced all the currencies with one single currency, and we had a period of time when physically the currency didn't exist, the notes and coins. If uh, over a weekend all the European leaders decide unilaterally that all the assets and liabilities, so all the private and public contracts, are redenominated into the national currencies um, according to the specific jurisdiction of each contract, uh, and uh, therefore all the claims are transformed into the new national currencies, and as of the next Monday, these new currencies start trading freely in the, uh, the interbank market. Uh, we do not need to have physical notes and coins. We can still exchange the legacy euros uh, until a future conversion date. Um, the final observation that I make is that the, the reason why the euro is still relatively strong or uh, is stable versus the dollar is probably a function of the fact that the market is actually expecting some breakup of the euro because uh, they, the markets are looking at the euro as a synthetic weighted average between a, a very valuable claim on Germany, which in all respect is the true new China, and a residual claim on the other countries. So you, you know that now a breakup of the euro will create an extremely strong currency, which is the new German currency and very weak currencies elsewhere. But if you have most of your claims, i.e. most of your deposits, in Germany, and that's why actually the, the liquidity and money supply in Germany is growing much more than any other country, you are actually going to benefit from the breakup. So my, fi my final point is that, this, as we know from game theory, strategic commitment is credible only if it's uh, difficult slash impossible to reverse. I do not think that the commitment to the euro is now that irreversible anymore. You said that Germany is the new China. Can you say a little more about that? When we think about China, we've always been elaborating on the concept that 
China is a country that grows at exponential level because it's very competitive in the international market. And it's all export-led, uh, and uh, and it's also making in, um, significant investment in infrastructure. Well, this is exactly what Germany is doing. So all the growth that Germany has experienced over the last uh, few years, and historically, but in particular in the last few years, has been driven entirely by exports. Uh, they have a, a huge level of competitiveness due to their technological um, uh, dominance, but also the competitiveness, the productivity gains that they've achieved over the last several years. And in fact, uh, the growth of the German economy is not coming from internal consumption at all. So when we keep arguing about China being almost an unfair competitor because it's got um, cheaper labor or in any case more competitive way of producing things, that actually applies to Germany as well. Um, so we shouldn't argue that the yuan needs to be revalued. We should argue that the, the new currency for Germany should be revalued. So what, in your view, are the odds of a Eurozone breakup? I still believe that the, the, the most likely scenario is that we keep this model through approach uh, with constant um, uh, shocks and, and volatility shocks uh, every other week as we are experiencing these days. And so this is probably the 50% the, the plus probability scenario. There is, in my opinion, at this time, uh, the breakup scenario, which was used to be negligible in terms of probability, is probably in the region of uh, 20 to 25%. And I still have a residual hope, so the remaining 20 to 25%, that uh, there is also the, the more uh, virtuous outcome, the more credible outcome, which would imply a strong commitment on the part of the Eurozone leaders to focus on some of the structural uh, difficulties and deficiencies of Europe, namely the absence of growth. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about if, um, if the European countries manage to hang together, um, what policy choices, in your view, should uh, Europe make in the coming years to ensure the long-term viability of the euro? Well, for a start, we did definitely we need to reverse some of the decisions that have been taken in recent times. I don't want to go back to what has been decided over the last two years. I think the historians, when they will be writing the history of Europe in, a, in, a, in, a, in this decade, would be at, uh, in disbelief in uh, analyzing the number of mistakes uh, that, that policymakers and, and, and EU, EU leaders have made uh, or since 2010. But let's look at what is the current policy mix. It's uh, collective austerity, so every single country in Europe is uh, um, urging uh, even stricter um, uh, fiscal discipline, and that's the consequence of the so-called fiscal compact. And on the other hand, you have uh, the, um, the LTRO, so the long-term refinancing operation by the European Central Bank. Now, the collective austerity is clearly a stupid approach because uh, it, it's, it's self-defeating. If everyone tries to um, reduce uh, simultaneously the, the fiscal deficit at the same time, you only are going to have a larger uh, recessionary impact. And so whatever benefit you have on the, on the, on the fiscal side is going to be wiped away by the contraction in the economy. <clears throat> the LTRO is not, <coughs> contrary to what people think, the same thing as a quantitative easing, because quantitative easing means that the central bank buys directly government paper in the market and therefore provides liquidity in a direct way. In the case of the LTRO, the European Central Bank offers to refinance the purchase of bonds made by individual banks, individual commercial banks, which means that the individual banks are actually even more intertwined with a sovereign risk in their own country. So in my opinion, the LTRO has got a huge boomerang effect on the credit worthiness of both banks and sovereigns. <clears throat> in terms of what should happen, I think that the, um, the most important issue is, as we know, the growth aspect. Because if uh, a continent, or by the way, most of the Western world, is in a so-called debt trap, you're going to get out of the debt trap only through growth, clearly not through, through, through more recession. So I think there should be a very strong commitment on the part of European leaders um, to, to support what we can call a growth agenda. I, we can discuss about it. I think one idea could be, for instance, uh, announcing that the aim for Europe is to achieve uh, energetic energy independence by 2020. 
and that would imply a number of significant investment uh, in the industrial sector, in the energy sector, in the infrastructure, including, by the way, investing in uh, solar and wind energy in, uh, in, in Greece. The second aspect uh, of, of policy should be that the fiscal compact, compact needs to be completely redesigned. Um, it is a, um, a conventional wisdom that the reason why Europe is now in trouble is the fiscal irresponsibility, but that is entirely wrong because most of the countries, uh, including Spain and Ireland and others, actually had a budget surplus over the, over the, the last decade. So that is not the reason. The reason was the fact that there were significant current account deficits. So in my opinion, if you want to uh, impose a balancing act in ev to every single um, European countries, uh, you don't have to focus that much or only on the budget deficit. You need to focus on the current account and balance of payments um, um, prospect and situation that they have, as well as in the, on the sustainability of the pension system, in particular whether it's a collective or an individual defined uh, um, contribution system. Um, the third aspect of a policy mix should be to create some form of, uh, of common guarantee for uh, the European uh, government uh, debt, so that is the so-called Eurobonds, the joint and several liabilities, although I've got some reservation on whether the Eurobonds could actually be implemented immediately. What I'm sure is that Greece needs to be pardoned once and for all on all the debt that is out there, because Greece will never be able, with, a, with the current setup of that economy, will never be able to grow out of its problem anymore. So we need to pardon this debt, give Greece a, a 20 years financial package at, at purely symbolic cost, um, uh, put, that, put Greece under protectorate, have a new coalition government that focus on building up an open competitive market economy over two decades. That is what, what is needed. And the final point, which is uh, controversial, but I think I want to raise it, is that there is another aspect which is very detrimental in Europe at this time, and it is that all the financial institutions are deleveraging in a simultaneous way. And the reason is that we have uh, the, the forthcoming um, implementation of the CRD4, so Basel III equivalent, which is forcing all banks to reduce their balance sheet at, at the speed of light. Now, this is entirely counterproductive from a, from a macroeconomic standpoint. So I would suggest that we should have a moratorium on Basel III for at least three years. And on the other hand, if banks are perceived to be still undercapitalized, we should force banks, or at least the so-called CFIs, the systemically important financial institutions, to recapitalize up to 10% uh, core tier one individual uh, ratio. And uh, what the gap of capital that is needed should be covered 50% by the European stability uh, mechanism through contingent convertible hybrids and 50% through uh, um, an open market placement, pari passu are the same condition as the one uh, offered to the ESM. That is my policy recipe. Excellent. Um, you mentioned Basel, uh, which of course is an international standard for prudential regulation for banks. Um, so let's talk maybe just a little bit about regulation within the United States. Um, and you've stated previously that, that Europe seems to be, to some extent, moving forward with financial regulatory reform, but that the United States is sitting on its hands. Um, what do you mean by that? What I mean is that the, after the, the, the financial crisis, um, there was an, an overwhelming reaction across uh, the globe uh, by, by regulators and policymakers to address the issue and making sure that systemic risk was curbed um, globally. Um, responses have taken different shapes. Uh, in the case of Europe, there has been a flurry of, of new directives. So the CRD4, um, uh, the MIFID II, IMR, and, and others. And uh, there, there seems to be a very strong determination by the, the European leaders to go ahead with this uh, um, uh, implementation, even if in the meantime, a lot of the conditions have changed. Um, and, but there is this, this regulatory zeal uh, and, and focus to go ahead at all costs. In the case of, of the US, you, uh, there was a, a very um, significant reaction instantly. So probably it was even quicker here. Um, and uh, the, 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 the all, all encompassing Dodd Frank Act uh, was, uh, was finalized and promulgated relatively quickly. But then there was obviously the whole phase of the implementation and, uh, and the, 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 the translation into practical 
um, uh, recommendations and rules. And you can see that the attempt to regulate the whole financial sector and, by the way, including the consumer um, uh, utilization of financial instruments in one single act has gone completely out of control because uh, if you think about uh, the so-called uh, the section 619, so the so-called Falker rule alone, has become more than 300 pages. There are 15,000 um, uh, replies on the part of financial institutions and, 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 and other participants in, in the economy that have been uh, submitting their own observations. It's virtually impossible to try to have a, a prescriptive, rule-based um, uh, supervisory approach. I think that you need to go back to some form of, of principle-based approach. So in one hand, on one hand, I think that the debate in the United States is probably healthier because uh, there, should, there is a little bit of, a, of a, um, awareness that maybe some of the initial reaction was, uh, was uh, exaggerated and needs to be um, uh, redefined on the basis of, of the actual conditions in the economy. On the other hand, uh, I see that a lot of this debate uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is a bit circular, so I do feel that mm -hmm. there is a very li li likelihood that very little is actually being decided at the end in the United States and implemented. And so you will have a completely um, uh, unleveled playing field with European banks uh, always under a more and more um, a stricter um, regulatory framework, whereas uh, American banks would be allowed to operate in a more, in a more, in a nimbler way, and you can already see that in the marketplace because I think that the European, the European banks are losing market share in, in the global um, financial markets on a daily basis. Here's a softball question for you, which is, as a as a banker. What are you, your views about too big to fail? This notion that large financial institutions should be broken up or that certain functions like proprietary trading should be prohibited? I think this is a topic which always raises very, uh, very extreme reactions uh, on the part of, uh, of all pe people involved. My view is very pragmatic. I, I've never believed that the too big to fail in itself was uh, the reason for what was, was the real source of the financial crisis. And the confirmation that I get, which has been argued by others, is that if you look at all the defaults that we had, there was nothing to do neither with the size of the organization nor with the business model that they were adopting. So we had a purely domestic uh, investment bank like Bear Stearns. You have purely you have global investment banks like Lehman Brothers. You have purely domestic mortgage and, 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 and commercial retail institution like Northern Rock. You had a global financial conglomerate as AIG. So as you can see, there was nothing related to the specific size or the business model, whether universal or, or specialized. I think that the common feature, if you look back at all the cases of, uh, of the faults and difficulties, have been uh, fundamentally three in my view. The, the fact that, that there was a, a shortage of capital, so these organizations were over leveraged. The fact that even more importantly, there was a very significant funding gap. So there was a huge mismatch in the profile of liabilities versus the assets. And so a lot of the long-term assets were refinanced in the short-term uh, wholesale market. And the third aspect, there was a combination of uh, inadequate risk management tools and probably not sufficiently competent um, governing bodies uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and senior executives and board of directors to supervise uh, the risk profile of the organization. If these are the three ele elements, that's where we need to work. I think that on the first aspect, that is the, the, the capital base, uh, now banks are operating with two and a half capital, two and a half times the capital they had in 2008. In the case of, of, of the funding mismatch, there is now a, 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 a very prescriptive attention on the liquidity profile of every organization, on the, um, uh, on, on the, the, the funding shortfall, and, uh, and any kind of, of uh, significant mismatch in asset liabilities. And in terms of, of risk management, A, we have completely uh, changed the risk management tools across uh, the globe. So just for instance, we moved from uh, the very uh, simplified uh, traditional VAR system to the much more refined uh, stress VAR um, uh, methodology. And also I think that 
all the boards of directors and the vast majority of senior management teams have been uh, replaced across the globe in all the most important financial institutions. Interestingly, nothing of that kind has happened at, at any of the regulators. So the regulators are always the same as they were in 2007 and that I think should, should probably trigger some, some uh, further thinking, I guess. One financial, I'm sorry, one further issue um, in financial regulation that also generates extreme views is the issue of derivatives, uh, which Warren Buffett famously called um, financial weapons of mass destruction. Now, a component of the Dodd-Frank bill is to um, place certain derivatives training, uh, trading onto clearinghouses um, to try to increase transparency um, and manage aggregate risk. Is that a good idea? First of all, I, I disagree, I beg to defer with, with Warren Buffett because uh, derivatives, uh, the vast majority of derivatives have been developed to um, address specific needs. So the fundamental, the source, the source of the creation of that, that derivative, that innovation was the fact there were needs on the part of clients. And, and so it's not the derivatives themselves that are a uh, weapon of mass destruction, but it's maybe the use uh, that was made of those very instruments by, by both end users and intermediaries. Um, my observation is that the, the, the vast majority of derivatives, the ones that are really useful for the end users, are over the counter and tailor made. And, uh, and you cannot standardize those derivatives uh, um, because the price, the cost would be that they would not be suitable to uh, hedge the risks. Uh, that they are supposed to, to, to hedge, so the needs of, of the final users. So you can only move to um, 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 a clearing house uh, uh, and a centralized settlement of uh, derivatives for the standardized one, uh, but you will not be able to do it for the over-the-counter, and I think that that's extremely important that we keep an over-the-counter market. Now, the um, two observations I make here is that first, those over-the-counter derivatives require active market maker and risk warehousing on the part of financial institutions. That's why the Volcker rule prohibiting proprietary trading is misleading because uh, that kind of risk warehousing can possibly be seen according to the strict definition that Volcker gives as proprietary trading. But, in, but on the contrary, that's actually a trade facilitation that dealer um, implement to be able to offer this kind of services to the clients. The second observation is that should we use much more significantly clearing houses, we need to make sure that they remain public utilities and not commercially competing organizations because we don't want to repeat the same mistakes that we made with rating agencies earlier last decade. Excellent. Um, one of the potentially positive side effects of the financial crisis was to expand the scope of global governance institutions to include emerging market countries. So here I'm thinking about membership and bodies such as the Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Board. Um, so now that we see countries like Brazil and China, India, Russia, Saudi Arabia included um, in these uh, governance bodies, is this consequential uh, for global finance? I think that the world economic order has changed, and it's, it's a fact. It's, it's, uh, it's not opinion anymore, and we need to come to terms with this fact. So as a consequence, also the world financial order is changing in terms of, uh, of the relative uh, importance of the different uh, uh, participants. I have some reservation uh, if the question is whether you want to extend too much the participation in some of these governing bodies. I have some reservation about including uh, these new countries because uh, the first precondition to be part of those bodies is that those very countries have implemented in their own markets the best standards. So they are, they are state of the art um, standards in terms of uh, market efficiency, in terms of market transparency, in terms of, uh, of a free flow of capital. Given that most of these countries do not have an entirely free capital markets. I do not, do not understand and do not have an entirely free banking sector, uh, which is still very much protected. I do not understand why they should sit on a body that uh, governs the, 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 the regulatory framework for 
the whole of the other countries if they themselves haven't set the example by adopting the best standards at home. So I think that precondition for having the likes of China uh, or Russia or, or others sitting at the, at, at the deciding table of the Basel Committee will have to be that they have uh, um, um, freely adopted uh, an open capital market standards at home. As a, a final question, I think I would be remiss if I didn't ask you a personal finance question. Um, how would you counsel the viewers of this video who are looking to invest in bonds or equities with a 10-year time frame? Well, the first recommendation that I want to give is that this is the time to protect the capital, first of all, rather than to maximize it. But I think that um, we need to be very much aware that um, this is a, 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 a very peculiar time from the point of view of, of, of the financial market, and it's a very much a transition moment. I think that there is still much more repricing that needs to be happened on the part of financial assets versus real assets. So there is still, in my opinion, an overvaluation of financial assets versus real assets. But let's go by asset classes. I do not think that uh, um, government bonds um, are, is, an investable, is investable anymore because uh, it's very clear that at this prevailing uh, um, yield level, you're actually suffering what is an implicit financial repression. So the yields are clearly negative in real terms. So you pay for the safety or alleged safety of, of the sovereign issuer, but you have to be aware that that is going to eat into the, your capital in real terms. So I think that uh, government bonds are, are, are out of question. Um, equities should actually be a better proxy of, of real assets, but my interpretation is that at these prices, at this multiple, they already factor in a, a very significant amount of good news. So I think that the upside potential is fairly limited. So what is left? I think I would, uh, I would try to buy, as I said, real assets, which means uh, in, a, in a financial terms, probably private equity on, on, on industrial uh, companies. Um, I, I would buy subordinated debt um, for financial institutions because uh, that's uh, the best proxy you have uh, to be exposed to the financial sector, but with relatively higher return in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, of flow of uh, payouts, and then probably um, emerging market uh, corporate bonds or um, high yield corporate bonds uh, in the Western world. Um, I think, however, it's very important to rationalize the fact that we are in a time of financial repression. We are in a time where still financial assets are, are way overvalued versus real assets, and a time when I think the sovereign risk of default is completely uh, underestimated uh, versus uh, the corporate risk of default. So we are facing with uh, poor governments and rich corporates, and instead the market seems to be giving much more credit to the governments rather than to corporates, and I think that this has to be reversed. Okay. Marco Mazzucchelli, thank you for your time.